Welcome to Expat Hoops. Today we talk to former George Mason and Delaware State player Jay Threet. His pro career started off in Iceland and has taken him all across Europe, and he joins us now from Poland. But before we get into the interview, I want to give you another reminder that we now have our own home, expathoops.com, where you can find all of our past and future content and links to all our social media and our Patreon. And now we welcome Jay to the pod. Happy to have you on, Jay. Hey, appreciate it. Thanks for having me, fellas. Oh, we've been looking forward to this for a while now. Um, you started at George Mason. We're all, uh, well, Tony and I are George Mason alone. Started at George Mason. Definitely remember you um, playing. Why did you decide to go to George Mason at that time? It's such a funny, funny story. Being George Mason alone, you guys might not like it, but it got me there. So I'm going to tell it. Um, do you remember, I think it was a CAA tournament? Um and my good friend Eric Maynard, he three straight steals. Yeah, and we remember. Learning. Yeah. <laughs> also, you're right. We don't and, like it. <laughs> yeah, that's it, not true. it was. That's not true. It was Eric right Maynard downtown. At the, he's he's a he's he follows our account. He's a fan. We'll definitely tag him on this. Yep. Yeah. So I I tell him this story all the time because George Mason were initially they were recruiting um, Jamar Abrams, my high school teammate, and we had one of the best teams in the state. So we had coaches in and out, and um, my first conversation with Larry Nega actually was, he saw me in the lunchroom. I seen him at open gym a few times. And he was like, hey, Jay, right? Like, where's Jamar? Like, he's looking for Jamar. So this is my, my first couple of encounters with him. They're coming to my school looking for Jamar. Um, he ends up picking ECU. Brandon Rozelle ends up picking VCU. Um, so that fast forwards it back to the, the CAA tournament, which was in Richmond at the time. And I don't need to get, take you guys back through the game, but yeah, please you know don't. those three, <laughs> those three straight steals by E. It just before they left Richmond, they called me, wanted to come meet with me. Like, yo, we need a guard. Like, you still available? And obviously, me, I, I was just like, all right, I'm gonna stay home. That was better than me waiting on a you know Power Five conference because um, I was close to a few bigger schools at the time. But probably because of my size and waiting on other guys, they were still hesitant. And when I saw that, I'm like, this is school coming relatively off the final four. Like, I was like, I get to stay close to home. At that time, it was, I, mean, I think, one of the best mid-majors in the country. So I was like, it's a no-brainer for me to stay home, be able to play close to home. So that's why I chose George Mason. Shout out to Eric. You chose Mason for an interesting reason. Um, why mm -hmm. did you eventually decide to transfer out and head to, uh, to Delaware State? Um, kind of got into you know a legal situation coming from high school before I got to George Mason uh, caused me to miss summer school mm. um, and I, I just was so behind um, I really you know all those other guys they're my guys talk to Isaiah Tate all the time Vlad all the time um, you know, those guys are coming from <laughs> yeah they 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 coming from private prep schools man we weren't really lifting weights down in Richmond like that. So when I get finally get to campus, I'm lifting weights. I'm behind in the weight room. I don't know where the cafeteria, I don't know what anything's at over George Mason. Like I'm getting lost. Plus the natural just coming from high school to college. It's just a diverse school. My high school wasn't that diverse. So it was a complete culture shock for me. So I spent a lot of time catching up. And then um, to be, be honest, I just think all of that was just held against me. Like, um, I got out of everything that I was into clean. Um, it just took some time to clear up. But once I got there, I was still in my eyes. And they'll tell you, was still like being punished for it. Like I was suspended for games and preseason stuff. And I was just like, wow. And I didn't say nothing, you know, kept my head down, just kept working. And I just felt like it kind of just probably put a sour taste in um, Coach's staff's mouth. And, and now you're older, I understand it. It probably was pressure from up top. Um, you know, I just felt like it was better for me to just take my situation elsewhere. So, yeah. But I will say about that experience, like, you know, I still have relationships with those guys. Um, I wish it kind of would have worked out. It would have been interesting to see what would have happened. Yeah, they but they were on some good teams. A lot right? of talent, man. Yeah, those are some good teams. Man, a lot of talent. And I just think, you know, if I stay, you get Cam more so his natural position. Um ended up turning out that basketball kind of changed into these big scoring guards anyway. 
But at the time, like, he wasn't a point guard. Um, so I just wish we could have just played with that. Because I think he got out. Do you remember all the freshmen in Lou Bird's song? We had a scrimmage. Mm-hmm. And Will and Daryl going to get mad at me. Daryl didn't play. And we beat the juniors and seniors in a scrimmage. Mm. Like, smacked them by like 25 with refs and everything mm. and then we replayed the game the next week and it killed us they just kept giving it to will we had no answer <laughs> <laughs> we had no answer for will well not not many other people did either uh, so don't <laughs> feel too badly about that but that's interesting that you that you beat them in a in a scrimmage situation transfer out of mason uh you end up at delaware state get a lot more playing time a little bit better situation for you tell us about that you were the steals leader in all of the ncaa in, two, in uh, 2010 so uh you had a great deal of defensive prowess while you were there as well. Yeah, we're so crazy about all those years. Just the transition from a, you know, a a nationally ranked team, a Nike elite school coming out the Final Four to, you know, a school in the MEAC. So everything's different, like the size of the campus. Um, I want to say just almost how how serious they took basketball. Like, it was kind of like my life. then you go there and just not having the same kind of resources, different style of basketball. We ran the flex, man. We ran the flex. You know how bad the flex is to run it for 40 minutes? And we don't have the size of, like, Boston College? It was, for me, it was awful being a, a guard that's, like, explosive and fast. And then I just had so many little injuries throughout those, my college years. Like, you could really put up a chart right now and do the Allen Iverson thing just everything hurt so for me it was like the one thing I could control was like defense like if we're gonna run and play this slow slow flex system like I, I gotta get steals I gotta get quick rebounds and I gotta run and try to go score um so that's what I kind of did I, mean, I didn't even realize I was anywhere near the top of the country until like halfway through the season the first year and from there and once I won it I was like oh I'm gonna try to get this every year in those next three years, I was like either one or two, my three years there playing. So it was, looking back, it's kind of like, wow, I really did that. And being able to say you've done something nobody's ever done before. I felt like once I made it out of that situation and just being there, I, I felt like I could do anything. Cause I felt like so restricted. Like, that's just not how I wanted to play basketball. Um, but, you know, you, you take things and, and you make the best out of it. And I feel like that's what I did. Well, off the pod, you were kind of talking about like, you know, that you're playing with certain people and, and saw that, they, you know, they went over professionally. And, and speaking of like a, a fit that may not have necessarily uh, highlighted your skills the best way. Um, at what point did you really start thinking about playing professionally realistically? Uh, and what was that process like in terms of um really i don't i wouldn't say explaining uh you know your your numbers because clearly your numbers especially being a steals leader are really good but in terms of saying that this wasn't an ideal fit for you did you have any struggles with that as well in terms of trying to get your first job out of college yeah uh so as far as looking at players you you kind of it gets real the older you get you know um i actually wanted to come out after my junior year, which was technically my senior year because I had to go to Delaware and sit a year because of the transfer uh, rules. And I was gone. I was like, man, I already got my agent. At this point, it ain't no NBA. We we know it's Europe. I know. Very realistic person. So I'm like, all right, let's, let's start calling people. And that's the NBA lockout. And I was like, Phew. coming from Dell State, NBA lockout, 5'11". I didn't get, I score way better than I can, than I was able to show. Like, I can't weather this storm. Like, I, I can't. So I had to go back to school. And they was like, all right, just go back to school, put up numbers. You're going to win. They know you for defense. Your teams are already interested. Just go score the ball and get better job. And came back, got hurt. Played the whole senior year, hurt. Like, torn ligaments in my foot. Um, But just for me, having older guys and even, Vlad and Daryl and Will and Eric Main, well, Eric was in the NBA, but Jamal Shula at VCU, all these guys in the basketball community that I have great relationships with, they were already in Europe. So I'm either watching their games or when they come home in the in the summer, 
we're playing pickup, we're working out together, and I'm learning the European game. And they like, listen, you are gonna fit in Europe. So that's when I was like, okay, it's it's really real. Like I got a real shot. And um, from there, it was just all about the opportunity, um, the right opportunity. And like you said, having those, you know, it's a numbers thing at the end of the day. They want to see you win, but if you're not coming from a power five school, you know, you got to have a specific skill set. And the thing that I just looked up with is I always had a specific skill set. Like I was working out with pros since high school um, down in Richmond and the surrounding areas. So I already was tailor made for it. I just had to have the interest um, to go along with it. Um, and I, I, I had a three or four offers early the year I came out. Um, but I broke my foot, my last college game. Oh, man. So now it's just like, here we go again. Like, Wait, you play a whole senior year injured, and then you break your foot right as soon as you're about to sign The whole senior year, I played yeah, some low-top Kobe's. It's crazy because now they're like the issue. For some guys, I played in low-top Kobe's, and we were playing Howard, and I never played in Kobe's. But I was trying to look cool because, you know, Howard got a lot of females. So I'm, I'm trying to look – I got some new shoes. I'm trying to look good, man. It's Howard now. <laughs> and I tear some ligaments. First time in my career, I missed games for injury. Spent all season getting back. Um, get to the MEAC tournament. I think we had a bye. I can't remember. I know I broke my left leg, like fractured my left ankle in that – that last game in the MEAC tournament. And that's what allowed Norfolk State to go on and win with Kyle O'Quinn. That's my guy. And then they go on and beat Missouri. So I am mm. pissed for like two months straight watching them win. And that should have been like you. Should have been me. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying we would have beat Missouri because, you know, it's a matchup thing. But I'm like a bunch of dynamic guards. and me, Like I, I want to – I know we were going to win the MEAC that year. So it just sucks that I was I, – I couldn't have the opportunity. Those offers I got – early my college coach went on vacation and actually didn't respond to any of the emails oh geez old school guy probably didn't even have it set up on his phone he's on vacation or out recruiting he just i don't know he just didn't return anybody's call and you know for a rookie they want to talk to your college coach they don't want to talk to your agent anymore they want to speak to who coached you to vouch for you and I had nobody but him, and he just didn't return calls. And I'm I'm pissed. I don't think I talked to him since this day. I, I got to learn to let stuff go. But it like pissed me off because I'm like, who doesn't have email on their phone in what 2012? So yeah, man, and I I know that you know work life balance and all that, but this is your life. You know, he was holding your life in his hands, and he dropped. Can, it. I couldn't get in contact with him. Yeah. And this also goes I got a into secretary. Nobody could get in contact with him. I, I mean, and this also kind of goes to what we talked about a little bit off the pod too, about like as soon as you're done, if you're not an NBA player or something like that, they just like forget about, it, which is crazy mm-hmm. to me. Mm-hmm. But I, you know, I got uh, five school records and they forgot about me. Quick, and, and it, <laughs> you would think it would be a recruiting asset because I mean, my God, the the odds of you getting into the nba are so small uh i mean mm-hmm. probably especially the, at a place like delaware state you know, well just in general, but yes and and no it's major. just yeah and it and it's just one of those things that you should in my opinion you as a you know college coach should not only say i've either landed a certain amount of people in the nba or if you're a low major be like i have landed people x amount of professional jobs and it just, it seems like one of these things that should be, um, I don't know, an asset or a recruiting point that it just seems whiffed on, mm-hmm. uh, especially now it seems perplexing. Maybe back then I can kind of understand, but the game is exploding across the world um, in popularity. And it's just, I don't know, boggles my mind. Yeah, that's exactly what me and, you know, me and my family thought, like, you know, I'm really having national success at this school. I'm not even pushing it. And, and once again, it's like another little brother to me. What was different from what I was doing and Briante was doing? Weaver. That's my little brother. I love him to death. But same thing. Not like he was at VCU. They had different levels of success on different level. I understand that. But I'm just talking about what is he known for? 
still the defense. It's not like he was a 20 point per game score. Like I'm doing the same thing. I, okay, he's six three and a half. <laughs> Different athleticism from the NBA, but I'm just talking about just pushing it. I didn't have that machine behind me. So it was just he just to be one obstacle and another obstacle and another obstacle. And then once I got that chance in Iceland, I was like, oh, once I get here, it's it's on. And so oh, you did the two little the two little three NBA workouts I had, my ankles broken. Yeah. And of course, they're all local teams, maybe the Wizards, Philly, and I, maybe New Jersey at the time. I don't even remember. But couldn't even go do it. But you did end up in Iceland. Uh, what was your yeah. experience like there? Whew. That's the only place I've been where it was cold from the time I got off the plane. And it was cold when I got on the plane to go home. It was freezing. Man, like, I had never felt that type of cold in my life. Uh, but you, you just grow up quick. The, um, the old, the old joke, of course, is that Iceland is very much more fertile than Greenland. But the truth is, when you go to Iceland, you know there's not a lack of ice. It's there. Oh, not at it's all. It's cold yeah, for sure. You know? <laughs> I don't even want to see Greenland if, that, if that's the case. No, don't you don't. It's just a, it's a glacier, yeah. a glacier, and and some some border town. Uh, but anyway, enough about geography. Yeah. Uh, let, let's talk more about <laughs> basketball. So your yeah. your experience on the court in Iceland, what was uh, what was that like? Were you were you playing in the top league there? Um, in yeah, Iceland? I've had quite league. a few uh, people on the pod that have played in Iceland. So yeah, I was in the top league there. Um, for me, it was just like a relief, you know, from day one. Um, coach had a lot of faith and trust in me, and he really just gave me the keys. And that's why they you saw numbers from me that you haven't seen in a while. I think I was average like close to 20 and nine or something. Um, and, you know, it's not the best league or the biggest league in the world, but I'm doing that on a winning team. And, you know, that was always most important to me. I'm doing that while we winning. Um, I'm learning European basketball. So I just took the best out of that situation and made it, made it work. And, well, and I mean, you got your start, which, you know, obviously we talked a little bit about how that that was kind of the problem uh, in the summertime. Mm-hmm. So you got there, you uh, showed up well, wound up going to Germany next. Um, what was the experience like playing in Germany going from Iceland for you? Uh, for me, it was, it was amazing. I think Germany is one of those countries everybody – that you probably talked to in Europe was like, they'll love to play. It's probably the most Americanized country in Europe. Um, it was a good time, man. Um, and I went right there for the first half of the season. I think I was second in scoring, second in assists. So I was just like, oh, y'all going to put me here on this? I'm going to go again. I'm going to just keep killing it. That was my mindset. Um, I had a chance to leave uh, twice during that year I remember a team from Ukraine tried to call and get me it was a lot of money and I'm like I'm gone I told my agent like let's do it I told my mom and she was like wait they got like a civil war or something going on not a civil war they had a war with Russia going on and I was like mom listen I don't care like my mom's from Baltimore I'm from Richmond I'm like I ain't scared like I'm going to get this money and play basketball like I'm not bothering nobody I don't care and they shot down the plane. And I was like, yeah, I'm not going. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not going man. I'm not going near that place. And I was like, I'm going to just stay because I liked it in Germany. Um, I like my teammates. Uh, so I stayed. Then I had another chance to go. Because that year in Germany, that was the second league. That was pro A, but it was the second league. Um, I had a team in the BBL. Uh, I had a chance to go play with Darius Adams. I think he's playing in China now. But he was ascending on his way up. And I got picked in the backcourt by a seven-footer and, like, bruised my collarbone really, really bad. I couldn't lift my arm up from right here. Like, so I was out. And I was like, I can't go hurt. I'm not going to pass the physical. And, of course, my team didn't want me to lose. I mean, leave because I was, you know, starting point guard, one of the best players on the team. So I was like, hey, just stay. We're winning. We're in top three. You'll be there next year. All teams are going to come. Long story short, players start getting hurt. Um, my coach stopped feeling pressure. We didn't end on a good note. I think that's probably one of the two times in my career I didn't make the playoffs and fired the coach the next day. He 
he's about he's bad mouthing everybody. Everybody. Like, and you know, so when I'm going to get these jobs the next year, I think I was still at 14, 15, no, like 15, 16 points, seven assists. I'm like, oh, I'm good. I had all this offer during the season. At the end of the season, I'm good. Like, I'm not even worried. But when you don't have that coach vouching for you and, and he's saying like the craziest things, like, oh, he's not playing to his potential. How many points you want me to average, coach? Like, like top seven in points and top two in assists. Like, what more you want from me? Um, so when you just don't have that co-sign, a coach can control your destiny so much over here in Europe. And that's why you'll see players having really average years and they get a coach that believes in them and they have a breakout year. So, yeah. like, in Europe, situations are really everything. I mean, that's the case with one of the last people we talked to uh, by the time this airs was Richard Kelly. And uh, I believe that I can't remember what what spot it was from what country to what country. But basically, uh, the only thing that, that was the same was the coach. Uh, he wound up going from one league to another, one country to another. And the only consistent there was the coach liked him um, and knew yeah. what he could do. Uh, so unfortunately, conversely, uh, that could also harm you. For sure. It'd go either way. <laughs> yep. I've seen a lot of role players look like superstars. And a lot of superstars go places and be like, uh, uh, a little different. So, uh, but Germany was fun though. I Man, I actually, the GM really just wrote me last week. Now they're in the BBL. So you never know what the future holds. So I still had a great, uh, pretty good relationship with him. That's good. So uh, at the time, though, left we were leaving Germany and looking for what was next with with all that going on. You did wind up in Finland. Uh, how was that all able to come together? And what was the experience like playing in Finland? Um, so going from that summer, so much in my life had happened. Like this is where like life hit me. Um, I remember I was in Tel Aviv in Israel. Um at a friend's game, he played for Maccabi the year David Black was coaching. And I get a call that my aunt had passed. So I, I'm dealing with this in the summertime, in that off season. Then I'm dealing with, I was one of the hottest players in Germany and these offers start coming in there a little lower. And I'm like, like this was far new what the coach was doing. So I've turned it down six, seven, maybe up to 10 jobs. Like, nope, nope, nope. And I heard this ridiculous amount of money. So I'm like, where are those offers at? So I end up turning down a lot. Some of them I shouldn't have. Some of them I should have. Um, I end up not going to Finland until like end of October. Mm. Or maybe early November, right before Thanksgiving. When did their season um, start? Just, uh, it probably started late August, mm. preseason. So I'm, I'm three months behind at this point. Yeah. Um, just... Just going through it internally, you know, when you, you lose somebody that was really close to you, just like, no, uh, it don't feel right. I'm not going. I don't want to leave my family. So when I finally went, man, I had a coach, a uh, serving coach. He just believed in me, was begging me to come. And long story short, we went out there. It was tough. It was cold again, freezing again. That was another reason I didn't want to go. I'm like, I'm tired of the cold. I'm tired of it. It's crazy because you see where I'm at now. But – uh, we get through that season. We end up winning and helping that team move up. So it it, it worked out in the end. Most of my stories end up doing, but it, it like going through it was just so mentally tough, mentally draining. Oh, and when I first got there, I left my phone on the plane, slipped out of my pocket. Oh, I would think your sponsors could have helped you with that. I mean, you were with BC News, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, they gave me a phone, but I lost my American, you know, I lost my iPhone. So now I got this Nokia iPad. This is a great start. <laughs> um, so I, I actually wanted to skip ahead a little bit. You have a lot of experience across Europe. Romania and Hungary came after Finland. Um, but yeah. you go to France. Uh, and by this point, what, what year is it when you first arrived in France? France was halfway through year four. I was playing um, mm -hmm. FIBA Cup. I was playing international in Hungary. Mm -hmm. And I was doing well internationally. Mm -hmm. And they gave me, they gave us free shoes. It was horrible. It was the, the choices to pick from were awful. So I just was like, all right, give me some LeBron. Shit, I should have known. Start playing in LeBron. Now my Achilles hurt. Them big old Timberland 
I don't know what number of LeBron they were. They were awful, man. I just got them because it was free. Like, all right, I played in them. It was awful. So I started having uh, like Achilles tendonitis, and then you know we're playing international. Um, two games a week, we're traveling. We were flying out of Vienna, so I, our day, our travel day, would be practice, practice, um, shower, leave to go to Vienna, an hour drive from um, where we were in Hungary, catch a flight to Portugal, Paris, France, two, three hour flight, get there, might practice again, next day shoot around, game. My body was going through it. Then get back the next day, stay, travel the next day back, practice and maybe leave to go on the road in Hungary. So it was a lot. It was my first time doing it. So, um, what happened? So I'm getting treatment, and I, my team in Hungary, the girls' team were Euroleague. They're way bigger deal than us. We're top three in the league, but they're Euroleague. Mm-hmm. They come first. Yep. So they had the best trainer, and they basically cut our treatment. Like, nah, if y'all want treatment, y'all got to go pay for it. I'm like, mm. what? Like, best player on the team? Like, how do you? Like, even me? Like, this is how I was. Like, even me. Like, okay, you told them that, but me? And it was like, yeah. I was like, okay, all right. So when FIBA Cup was over, I left. Um, you know, it's a fight. Teams never want you to leave, and especially good players. So I ended up basically telling them to keep the money for that month and, like, had to pay them a little more to get this opportunity in France when I went because I had played well against the French team in the um, FIBA Cup. So that's how I got to France. I basically paid to go to France, like, wow. better myself. And he stayed there for close to three seasons, so it must have been a great deal of success for you. Yeah, but it's so different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm playing in Hungary, then you, I'm going to France, and everybody's athletic. Like, I played my team. My center was 7-4. Played EuroLeague for – he's back in France now for Asheville, Tony Parker's team. 7-4, he can run. So, the little layups and floaters I'm doing in Hungary, he's like, uh-uh. He's blocking <laughs> everything. <laughs> I'm like, hold on, man. I'm scratching my head. Like, what's going on? Like, everybody's bigger, faster, stronger. Uh, Sekou Dumbaya was on my team. He was like the 13, 14 pick three years ago for Detroit, but he was 16. Wow. So, like, I'm playing with grown men, but I'm playing with kids. And then in some games, you know, he's our coach, my Rudy, my guy. He's rotating and, and shorting our minutes to play the kid because scouts are there. Like, man, you, if the Lakers here, I want to play too. Like, I don't <laughs> like I don't care about St. Cool. He's 16. He don't even – he don't know what's going on. Like, he's just playing basketball. He don't know what's going on. So, I mean, it was – Ignorance is bliss sometimes. <laughs> right. So, you know, he was a kid. He's just playing mm-hmm. basketball. He just want to mm-hmm. play. He don't care about Reagan, making the right pass. He want to score and dunk on you. That's it. But, uh, yeah, France, man, became my home. I stayed there for the rest of that season. Ended up playing pretty well. Um, after the Achilles, I got my Achilles straight. The next year, I stayed the whole year. Won the, I think we won, won the cup, lost in the playoffs, and then I went back. And I think that's the year I got to. Uh, I did the same thing I did in Hungary because I was um I was hurt a little bit that full year, and you know some teams were like ah oh, he's hurt, he's asking for too much money, he's hurt. Like, all right, so I went back to my first team in France because I knew the coach. I knew the situation. I was really comfortable. Like, all right, I'm going to go here. And I told them, I'm going to go here. But the first real legit offer I get in a, in, a, in a better league, I'm gone. And they took five games. And then they, they act like they forgot. And here we go again, buying myself out of another contract, betting on myself, going to Lithuania. So it was. But France is, is really probably my second home. I played there the longest. Um, probably had the best relationships there. So it was it was exciting, man. I, I, I liked it. Had the most people come visit. Nobody wanted to come to Finland and Iceland. All my family wanted to come to uh wanted to come to France and see Paris and all of that. You know how it go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> well, and and we'll probably get into some extras with you too because we talked off the pod about. Uh, some of the unique things about France, but uh, in mm. terms of going to Lithuania, um, what was the experience like adapting there? Because that's another place that's cold. 
once again, I cannot escape the cold. Like, why me? Um, but it was, you go from France, which is really more style of play. It's more kind of like a G League, more athletic, big, fast, strong guys. Um, he could to Lithuania and it's complete team basketball, more technical. Don't you break the play unless you're that guy. And even still, it's going to be certain situations. So from there, it was, it was just adapting back to like the Eastern European type of type of game, man. So it was, I think it was really good for me. Once I settled in, I had a lot of success in Lithuania. Um, once again, I think I was second. I probably finished like top five in scoring, top two in assists. So that was like a really, really, really big, important year for me. But going through it, I didn't know. You, you never, I never know that this stuff is going to work out. Um, I remember the first year, the first month I was there, I was like living in the hotel. So, you know, you can't even cook. You just got to order out. I'm in a small town. It's like a village. When I mean a village, a village. Like it didn't have a McDonald's. Like where in the world doesn't have a McDonald's? Like that's how small it was. And I don't even eat McDonald's like that, but that's how small it was. And I was, I was going through it, like mentally going through it. Like, did I make the best decision? I left somewhere I was comfortable with. I actually paid money to leave somewhere I was comfortable to come here. Um, that was what my, we'll be looking at this time, my seventh year, six, six, seventh year. So I'm like, man, this stuff got to start panning out, like in a big way, real, real soon. So it was, it was interesting. It was interesting, I- but I liked it out there. To your point about McDonald's and overseas, that's one of the things that our, our friend Porter Troop has said is like it's a, a, yeah. a professional basketball player overseas, one of their best signs, uh, best places, whether you actually like eating there or not. Uh, I know that your friend um, Mikel uh, actually mm-hmm. joined us from a McDonald's to do his interview in Brazil. So uh, yeah. McDonald's, if you're listening, uh, we are accepting sponsorships now. <laughs> yeah, get, get them right. Get my guys right. Or we're yeah. just kidding. Or are we? <laughs> yeah i mean we'll even take Arby's uh if, if we're not yeah. there, so. <laughs> sure. um but you go back to poland after lithuania um and you've got an interesting experience because not only have you been familiar with poland but you're in poland right before covid strikes as it strikes and then you go back after it actually has the initial outbreak obviously we're still in covid um can you compare and contrast kind of like what Poland was like um, during that time? And we asked this question of virtually everybody, what's your COVID story like specifically? Um, so yeah, when I get into Poland, get into that team that year, it was, it was up and down. I really went, I had, for me, my best offers were in Poland or going to Asia. Well, I, I never played in Asia. So I'm looking at, familiarity like I know Europe I know what I'm gonna get I know my role in Europe um and I went because I played with Yancey Gates in Lithuania the last two months and if I went they were giving me the chance to play with, with Yancey again oh, I get to play with one of the best bigs outside of Daryl and Will Thomas that I've ever played with like I'm taking that like I'm going and Asia didn't start until November I think the season so I'm like I'm losing I'm already three checks behind I'm gonna just take I'm going to just take it. So um, it was pretty, it was okay. One of my best apartments, the living was cool. The team was, they actually just won the league last year. So I knew they were uh, an ambitious team. Um, and then we, we we ramping up right before playoffs. Well, quick story before that. Um, one of my friends, Reggie Williams, went to VMI, played six years in the NBA. He was playing a career. He called me in January, he FaceTimed me with a mask on. I'm like, oh, what the hell is that? Like, what you got going on over there? He's like, man, this virus, I don't know if you heard about it. It's blah, blah, blah. I'm like, man, that stuff is in China. Probably like every like, American initially, like, man, that's not coming over here. Like, y'all keep that over there. Don't bring it over here. And then for what, two months later in March is when they officially shut everything down i think in europe we shut down maybe two weeks before america 
Mm-hmm. So that sounds about right. The got, the, Italy yeah. got it about three weeks before that. So yeah, right. Italy was worse. It was mm-hmm. it was worse. I think it was a delayed reaction in Poland because you know, not a huge tourist spot. Like Spain, Greece, Italy, France, they caught it worse because mm-hmm. more people go, more people in and out. So um, initially when it happened, I didn't leave. It was me and uh, Darnell Jackson on my team because um, Yancey ended up leaving. Um, he went to Kansas, won national championship, played in the NBA. So he was on my team, and we I was literally just with his family every day for like three weeks. I stayed over there because I didn't want to leave until the league officially canceled the season because I knew I know how they get with the more money. It's like, ah, right, mm-hmm. right, you can go home. Uh, yeah, you ain't getting your money. So I was I'm smarter than that. Like, I knew I knew what they were going to do. So I just stayed and waited it out and like, man, I was like going through it. Like just in the house every day, three weeks, nothing to do, no basketball, no idea of what's going on. You know, the world, it's the first time anything like that has happened. So nobody knew. Um, and then I think Trump had put out, he put out something that said, basically, if you're American, you need to get home. Like, he basically told everybody to go home. I, I called my agent. I said, listen, all right, let me go before they really close down the borders. And they had to smuggle me out of here. Like, no Polish airports was, was flying out. Like, they closed mm-hmm. airports. So I had to, like, get on the train, get to Berlin, and then fly from Berlin. Oof. How long of a train yeah. ride is that? From where I was at, it was at least five hours. Yeah, mm. that's actually a little shorter than I thought it would be. That's that's yeah, not, it's five, not too bad. Hours from, I wasn't I wasn't too far away from. Yeah, it. so it was five six hours, and then you know then you got the whole sixteen to twenty hour flight pattern. Yep. And you, get and you probably didn't fly straight back to where you wanted to either, because there were a few mm-hmm. airports here that were closed off to international flights and all that. So yeah, it was straight to Amsterdam and then it, to Dallas. I think mm-hmm. Dallas was still open. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was it. And then with me being home, not knowing what to do, we, I'm working out every day. Every day. Just, I was one of the few that's fortunate enough to have somebody that had a private gym. Because, mm. you know, high schools were closed. Yep. Um, couldn't get into VCU like I normally get into it. Couldn't get anywhere. So we had a friend that really had a private gym and just going there, two or three of us, and just work out. Yeah, and one of our earliest... In one of our earliest episodes, we interviewed uh, Fallon Stevens, who was in the middle of a COVID shutdown in twenty fall twenty twenty, um, mm-hmm. and she was basically working out with whatever she could scramble and find in her apartment. Uh, she was in a second mm-hmm. league uh, team, uh, B league in Iceland, and uh, when they shut down, you know the gyms, the gyms basically shut down, the high school shut down, people couldn't really go much of anywhere there, so it was it was difficult for her to to maintain. Um, training while she could but it was it was a little bit mm-hmm. difficult for everybody uh how about how long did you stay home uh after you got home from poland and eventually got your job back in france i stayed man i stayed like nine months mm-hmm. i stayed for a long time I, uh so that was march what 2020 mm-hmm. i came back to poland last year around this time like january 18th 19th so from that time well to sum it up i was i was fighting for my money from poland Mm -hmm. because they didn't want to pay the rest of the contract so i'm fighting with them um getting a lawyer in europe like y'all owe me a lot of money like come on like this dude is right so i'm I'm dealing with that then i'm working out every day to the point i like i injure myself this is how I knew I was getting up there a little bit in age. Nobody touched me. <laughs> I'm playing with the college kids, like uh, Bones Highland, uh Mikhail was in the gym. Um, Armando, that's at UNC right now. All the kids, I'm trying to run with the kids. I'm trying to feel young and show them that I still can do what I do. <laughs> right? It's ego thing. And you know what's crazy? Man, I got hurt on my day off. My trainer said, take the day off. We've been working hard. Take the day off. I went to go play pickup and got hurt. I mm-hmm. tore something in my plantar fascia. Oh, so, you know, that's on your worst. foot. So it's bad. So I'm going through that in COVID. Um, it's still trying to start up in Europe, but nobody's sure. Of course, teams' budgets are, if they had a budget, it's, nobody knows. The budgets are awful. 
offers are coming in super low. You don't know who's lying, who's telling the truth. Is the season going to finish? Like it was, it was all of that going on. So I didn't like pretty much none of the offers, and then I got injured in July. So I'm just using COVID to not go. And um, then you know you work your way back. Still didn't like the offers, and I end up having to go to Vegas for like three months and just work with uh, my now trainer on like my corrective movements and rehabilitation and everything. So once I did all of that, it got to January. I was like, okay, I got to take something. Like I got to take one of these offers, go somewhere, and just make it work. Because you know that's what March to January. I don't know, eight nine months with really no income, like. Thank God I was really smart with my money. I saved. You know, I, I was ready for a rainy day. I don't know if I was ready for a pandemic, but I was ready for a rainy day. And uh, so that was the mindset. And I was just like, where can I go, especially come off an injury where it's a respected league. I don't have to go in there right away and just kill it. Like, I don't have to go completely prove myself. But, like, what's the best situation for me? And um, they ended up being back in um, Poland. And I looked at it like it was really two months, two and a half months, because that season ended early. I was like, I got nine official games in the Polish Cup. And I was like, when I get there, I got to just, I got to go play. I got to win. And we did all of that. Um, it was it was crazy, because now we're in the house, just practice house, practice house, nothing. Because, you know, we're in COVID, in the height of it at that time still. So we're just, figuring it out like we're in a gym longer than we should be because we just don't want to go home <laughs> like the coach he's like man go home like, he like and do what like nothing to do so we did that and that was my second stint in Poland oh and then as soon as that finished in the playoffs in April I got the call to uh go back to France so I was like I'm gonna double up and make I'm gonna make it work and I went to Paul. I mean, when we went back to Paul Artez in the South of France for two and a half, almost three months, um, had to turn that team around. Hmm. So even though I even though I came in January, like I legit missed four and a half months of the season, I still ended up playing 17 games in Poland, which is a full half a season. Then I went to France, and they had stopped for like six weeks their season, so they had to make up a bunch of games. So in my two and a half months, I played another 16, 17 games. And if you know a Europe season, that's that's a whole Europe season, like 34 games if you're not playing internationally. I played a whole, I still played a whole European season in half the time. Yeah. And my body would, went through it. Like we were playing games on like an NBA schedule when I got to France. And of course we're practicing. Like I remember practicing at 10 a.m after a big time road win the night before at home. Uh, but oh, yeah. your, your current season, uh, you started in Greece and now you're yeah. back in Poland. So yeah. how'd you end up in Greece? And then how'd you end up in Poland mid season? Um, so after leaving the French season last, last year, we got, um, we got back. I like got home June 20th, I believe, which is extremely late. And, you know, you start going to preseason in Europe, like second week of August, first week of August sometimes, depending on where you're going. Like, so I was legit home for six weeks mm -hmm. this summer. No time to really rest and, like, ramp it back up and get treatment. And, like, it was tough. Um, and Poe, they got new management, like new ownership on every level. Um, Stu Jackson is, like, GM now. Rick Pitino's ownership group bought the club. So it was a ton of changes. Um, you know, we wanted to run the team back. That was probably the most talented team I've played on in Europe, like maybe in my life. That's extremely talented team. Our last 16, 17 games, we were top four. And I got there, they were um, second to last in the league. So we went like 12 and four, 12 and five when I was there. So I'm like, oh, they got to bring me back. Like, South of France is about to open up like a little bit um, from the COVID restrictions. Because when I was there, we had curfew at 7 p.m. And then towards the end, it went to 9 p.m. 
like not the team, the whole city. Like yep. nothing was open. So I'm like, oh, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. And um, with the ownership changing, they stalled. They didn't know. It was like, eh, we want Jay back. We didn't know. So I'm kind of waiting for them. I'm kind of telling my agent, like, I got home June 20th. I don't really want to talk basketball, my guy. Like, don't. Matter of fact, I don't want to see your name come up on my phone. If it's not something I can't turn down, I don't want to talk about basketball. I'm not watching the playoffs until it's like a premier matchup. Like, I was burnt out from basketball. Um, so that's why I was at mentally. And then by the time I opened back up to it mid-July, some of the same issues. Teams are low-balling. They don't know their budgets. Not everybody's recovered from COVID. Um, now we have a better understanding because it, it wasn't like the year before, but you still really don't know. Um, and I was actually in Vegas on my birthday, and Poe ended up signing somebody else that had a really good year. I'm like, God, I waited. I thought I was going back. Like I legit thought I was going back. And so now you take what's the best available. I'm like, man, I want to try something new. I've never played in Greece. I've never even been to Greece. I always stayed away from Greece. The economy is bad. And I had got word from Jamal Schuler, um, a bunch of agents, guys that played at this team. Like, this team, like, they're one of the teams that pay on time. So I'm like, okay, um, you know, who wouldn't want to go live in Greece? This is the time for me to try it. I played so many places. If it doesn't go well, I'm good somewhere else. So I, I, I just, took a, I just took faith and just tried something out. And it wasn't horrible at first. Living, I had a, a house, like a three-story house that was cool. It's hot, it's no snow finally, first time. Like my first month, I was ecstatic. Um, and then, you know, I just don't think they put the right team around me. Um, you gotta surround me with a bunch of shooters in the bed, you like they just put young guys around me and guys that are that don't really have they didn't put the level around me that I needed. So they hard headed me, they doubled me all preseason. And I'm, you know, I just played six weeks ago. I'm completely burnt out from basketball. I'm like, man, I don't I'm not fighting with y'all in preseason. I'm 10 years in, I'm a vet. Like I'm not, huh? I'm just passing it to other guys, seeing what they can do. And I convinced like somebody who's like a little brother to me, uh, Jalen Hudson. He went to Virginia Tech and then finished at Florida to come. So that was help. But that was it. He's still young in the European game. Like decided G League. He needed time to adjust. Um, he's doing well now. But other than Jalen, I had no help. So um, we fast forward and three games in. On the fourth game, I basically tear my hamstring first two minutes of the game. Which pissed me off, and I got zeros on the <laughs> across the stat sheet. Like I'm like, wow, everything just dropped. Like, um, well, before that, the money was late, and I was about to leave. My first two months of the season, the money was late, and I'm like, uh, I could have left. The team I'm on now actually called me. I had probably half the teams in Poland called me. Other teams were calling me from other situations, and I was like, ah, uh, still Greece. I'm gonna wait it out until Christmas because I'm still putting up solid numbers and Greece is a respected league. So once I got hurt, I was like, oh God, they really not gonna try to pay me now or they just gonna mess with me because I know how it go. And that's pretty much what happened. I mean, I was doing my rehab process. They had, the, the, the treatment part was fine. But when it got time for me to like rehab and build myself back up to playing, they didn't have anybody that was qualified for that. So I'm using my guy that got me um, healthy the year before, before I went to Poland. I'm working with him every day and I'm progressing. But they didn't like that because they didn't really have any control in it. Like, he's not going to push me. He, he has my best interest at heart. You know, these they, a lot of these teams, they don't really care about the players. They just want you, they want your talent. They want you on the court. So once again, I'm talking to Daryl, talking to, um, Jamal Schuler and they like, man, don't step on that court if you're not healthy, because then they're going to start blaming you. You know, I'm the highest paid guy on the team. As soon as I they losing games, like, boy, don't you step on that last, don't go for that last place team, and y'all get beat by 25. Like, don't go out there. So that's, that's what was happening, and they fired the coach, the head assistant coach, three players, 
and was like begging me to come back. I'm like, I'm not coming back to that. Y'all one and eight, uh, one and seven. I was like, I'm done. And my money late. I'm out of here. Yeah, I, I'm not gonna risk my health and not get not get big. Hey, I was like, I'm out. So at the time, without me having a leverage, when my stats dropped, um, one of the best situations for me was back was was here in Poland. It's another ambitious club. I don't have money problems. Um, and they needed me, wanted me, you know. So it's, I always have a love hate relationship with Poland. Hate the weather. Really, really hate the weather. But it's cool, man. Sometimes you got to be where you where you want it. Definitely. And I think that that was probably the portion of time that we actually started talking where you're like, I hate my situation yeah. now, uh, but it's going to be yeah. fine in a little while. So that yeah. all checks out. Couldn't, couldn't, couldn't really talk about it, you know, the, Greek media. If I put a tweet out, they they pick up on it, and uh, I'm not gonna really, can't really talk about it. And then just going through that, you know, and you, like having that going and being in a certain headspace. It's like, man, here we go. It's another obstacle. Why can't I just get to where and it work right? Um, so you know, a little older now. I was in the process of you know buying a house. And he's like, yo, I can't do all that, and this money not coming in. Like I need it all, you know. We, I can't go to tell people these bills that I got that, oh, my team, they're 50 days late paying me. Sorry, America, you'll get your money. Visa, MasterCard, whatever, bills, car note. Nah, it doesn't work like that. So right. for me, I was like, I got to get out of here. Uh, you know, you're on social media, virtually all our guests are on social media, like, what you know, whatever the platforms are. What... What is it like? I mean, I'm sure there's probably some places that you probably feel you could get away with, you know, either tweeting something or putting a message out, um, you know, depending on what it is. But what is that like playing in a place um, or maybe you don't even necessarily suspect it and you just kind of have a universal approach about like, I just can't tweet this because I don't want this to be it. Because again, you know, you're talking about you're a 10 year vet by now and everything like that. So, you know, the benefit of, of being this many years in and, and the, the age that you're, you are at with social media what's I guess your best advice in terms of navigating that for anybody that might be starting out now don't tweet <laughs> don't, don't put nothing out there that, that could come back to potentially hurt you in the end you know um it's tough because there's so much on social media now and everybody's on there you just never know who's watching that's that's really the best like I mean you see celebrities in the stages they tweeting and they putting up stuff from five years ago Mm -hmm. like you got to be mindful of what you put on the internet like because it's there to stay like, you can delete it somebody's probably already screenshotted it and um especially overseas players you're whether you no matter the level you're 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 a public figure in those countries like you might not be the biggest but somebody's gonna see it <laughs> and you just gotta be uh, you just gotta be mindful of what you put out there um you know some some countries are you know, some some countries fans are worse than others. I know in Poland, I make a tweet right. I could tweet right now, and it's gone. What's Jay talking about? Uh, just because they know me here, and I, I joke, I interact with them sometimes. Um, but you just gotta be mindful of what you put out there, especially if you're talking about like basketball. Because I could I could be watching Daryl game or, or, or Will game for an example, and if I be like just make a general tweet about basketball. They'll think you're talking about players on your team or your situation or your coach. And it's like, man, I don't even talking about that. Like, you don't know what I'm talking about, but it's just out there. That'll do it for this episode of Expat Hoops with J3. Reminder to check out our new website, expathoops.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us wherever you get your audio podcasts. Also, you can help support us on Patreon where our members get additional content and benefits. It's a win-win, so help support the pod there as we continue to bring interviews from across the world.